Okay. There we go. Hi. So um, hopefully people will find their ways in, but we should start sort of on time. Um, this this is Ugo, as promised, my cat. And this <laughs> is and this is Trudel. How old how old is Ugo? Ugo is either 12 or 13. We don't really know because he was feral when I got him. And, um, and, and he so lies about, it. and he's habitually lying about his past. Like a yes. lot of guys. Exactly. Like a lot of guys, he lies about his past. <laughs> exactly, exactly. He's, 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 got, he's got a very romantic version of himself. Um, <laughs> though, 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 though he has been referred to by friends of mine as the George Clooney of cats. So uh, th that should be said. Well, and that is definitely quite a moniker. <laughs> it is, it is. So, so according to uh, Bill's incredibly detailed schedule that he came up with, which is just amazing, and I'm so impressed, I am now meant to introduce, uh, no, to ask you to introduce yourself. Well, yeah, Until well, I was going to say first that Strudel here, who is very food oriented, can you hear the crunching of the treat? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. So she's so she's a mini dachshund, and um, and she recently celebrated her sixth birthday. Um, we got her as a puppy from a breeder in New Jersey. So we we rescued her from New Jersey. That's that's the story we're sticking to. So okay, good save, good save. Oh, there's Susan. Thank goodness. Great. Okay. Um, uh, great. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, isn't it great? Like you take photos of your cat or your dog and they get more likes than your writing. Oh, always. I mean, literally <laughs> always. There's no doubt. And actually the most likes I think I've ever gotten was a photo, I, a very blurry photo I took of an owl in Inwood a few days ago. <laughs> so like, it's like, well, that's more popular than that, uh, story that took me eight months to write a mere yeah. eight months. <laughs> Exactly. And then I waited two years for it to get published. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Strudel go back to her mommy. Okay. Her. She's gonna wave. It's gonna wave Bye, goodbye Strudel. to everybody. It's good you yeah. don't you're not in New Jersey anymore. <laughs> okay. Um so anyway, um as we were saying, uh, the Columbia House Records Club. That's right. That's what we're here to talk about today. <laughs> you know that you can get all of Montevani's best symphonies and all of the string quartets of Beethoven for four ninety nine. Yeah, but you have to act now. Act now. Act now. Act now. <laughs> anyway, I'm absolutely totally sober. But I'm saying all this. This is because this is just how I am. Um, but to answer your question, um, you said, "How about you introduce yourself?" Um, yes. I think the best way to peep for people to understand me, and for me to understand me, is uh, I like to think of myself as a not as the George Clooney of cats, because I am definitely not the George Clooney of cats, uh, but as a 21st century realist. And that's a term that a friend of mine came up with. And I think it's applicable because, um, I mean, a lot of what we see in contemporary writing, or what we call contemporary writing is really kind of academic workshop culture. It isn't, it's its own sort of self-contained thing. It's like a fandom it doesn't it's it's it doesn't it's not really responding or um reacting to the world except to deny it i feel you know like a lot of times you say oh you see somebody and they say oh i i wrote this poem and it's based on this 17th century form you know or this is a villanelle or something else and you know i mean like people like um, somebody like Bernadette Mayer, I mean, she's she did wonderful things with the sonnet. You know, Clark Coolidge has has done great things with the sonnet. But I feel like people are kind of ignoring a lot of the contemporary 
forms that are kind of right in front of our faces. You know, well, that's that seems to lead in really well to our next bit. <laughs> yeah, our next Colum bit about the Columbia Records deal or <laughs> what gave you the idea for <laughs> instrument for distributed. Empathy, Empathy monetization. monetization. Yeah, <laughs> which like rolls, I was I was which like, sure. rolls, rolls right, right off, off the, the tongue. tongue. Right off the tongue. Yes. You um, can get this before midnight tonight <laughs> from Kern Pine. And we'll yes. and we'll throw in <laughs> we'll throw in the Farrah Fawcett makeover kit. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Jesse, you got that, right? You can you can throw in that. Yeah, she's got it. She's here. She's ready to throw in the Farrah Fawcett makeup kit. I'm sure she has one in the back. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, I mean, literally, literally, um, because my day job is um, technology PR, um, I subscribe to like all sorts of different, you know, emails and lists and so forth. And this service sent me, um, and they send me weekly like templates and the template that I got was uh, building empathy at your organization, you know, and it was all of these templates. And I'm like, wow, this like dovetails so nicely with, with the whole psychosis of, you know, corporations are people, you know, uh, if corporations are people, what are people? I don't know, you know, and that's kind of where I started, you know, and um, I mean, like right here is literally, you know, this this is almost like a, a mandala, you know, and I, I literally just started taking um, words, you know, weird. I mean, I would just kind of, I, I was reading a lot of language poetry and I just, you know, just, started putting in strings of words and I just kind of work very atomistically. And I said, let me put this word next to this one. It was just like playing with colors, you know, to see what, which two words would have the best contrast. And it's just started working on a very miniature level like that. And then I just built out this one template. And then I said, well, I, I should write something before this and then I'll write something after this. And that's literally how this whole thing evolved. And, um, you know, it's the weirdest thing. And I was very shocked when um, Kern Punk said, yes, we love this, we wanna publish it. And then I was equally shocked every time um, it's been reviewed so positively. I mean, I've gotten, really good reviews from Entropy that sort of kicked it all off, rest in peace, Entropy. Then Kirkus and uh, Rain Taxi really gave it a nice review. There's a podcast called Leaf by Leaf. Um, the, the, the host, I mean, he gave it like a 15 minute video review and went nuts. It turns out he's like by day, he's like a computer programmer. And then I have a review coming out in, um, West Elm and I read the copy of it over the weekend and it's like you know and 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 also that leaf by leaf podcast named it the most innovative book of the year and it's like you know up there with like major authors and I'm just you know a regular person trying to sell waffle irons you know well I think you should read us some of the yeah, show sure. Us, however you want to present it, I don't know. I'll yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll read it. Um, and um, for those who are playing along at home um, on the home game, the home version of Password, um, I'm just going to start at page one and and just kind of just kind of work my way through it. Um, the other thing I'll say is um, a lot of the language here is uh, kind of repurp. That's right. The lot of the language here is repurposed from Google patents. So it's all like that image that you're holding up right there, Julia. That's um, that's a, a Google patent for a, a sleep apnea machine. 
but it looks like this very Orwellian thing. So I like use the language from these patents because the, comp the corporations sort of reveal their true evil purposes in these patents. And also the language is very interesting. Anyway, enough of that bullshit. I'm gonna talk. I'm just gonna read this shit now. When the company achieved personhood, it sought empathy to emulsify its being. See artificial person, see infrastructure, see how to carry sky in a sports bag or luxury tote, see revaluation of value. The model is dependent on subject, subject ingested as data we begin monetizing in the customer's voice. The feeling is a joke swelled with blood just beyond the jaw. In certain cultures, it takes gel form to return skin to finger. In its natural state, it is made of feather, of sparkle, its oblong shadow traveling an icy river between elbow and wrist, inherited tendril or snapping at the crest of frozen wave. Fabricast grade contact, two, two centimeters, electroformed with cumulus shape, nimbus tolerance, attachment via leather or flexible material strop, Fabricast grade recommended or semi permanent location, also conduction. According to recent tests, sentiment can be extracted at rates comparable to the hydraulic fracturing of angels. Meat peeled back, pink marbled sky, 9,000 pounds of pressure per square inch crossing bone. Diagnostic. What do they think and feel? No light between syllables. Needles carved from a long stemmed breath. What do they hear? Same day vegetation. Still motile, but easy to dominate. A dry vowel crossing the septum. What do they see? Blist syntax, sentiment pressed from dull colorless memory and named for you. Cancer that autographs bluebirds for your sleeve. What do they say and do? Some melt tundra to wick. Some carve teepees from a furred alphabet. The subject is a basement where we hide our breath. Breath piled one atop another, some dotted with words, others holding a lone syllable, broken from a word never born. Breath once discarded, ridged with memory. They cut when pinched at the root. The feeling does not present as motile. Newly hatched, it resides in the body's trow while living on nutrients stored in yolk sacs. As the feeling grows, it is monitored so all the feeling in any one area approximates equal size. Consistency prevents the establishment of a clear consumption hierarchy in which larger feelings take, take food at the expense of smaller emotions. Consistency also prevents cannibalism, allows the subject to choose a nutrient amount suitable from all, for all feeling present. To be watched is to be loved. It's why we watch ourselves as the grape pinched at a lover's lip, why we dream the camera a bird that accepts our finger, the skin at the tip ribboning back 
toward bone. Eternity is always overdressed. Watching is how we unsee everything not soft light and joy that runs along the curtain without shadow. So I'm gonna leave it there, so. I, I did my best to follow it along. It was, <laughs> so the people yeah, I know, I was jumping around. Visuals. I know. I was like, wait, wait, you changed it. <laughs> so I, just, I, did, I did my best to be Vanna White there for you. but um. <laughs> I was going to say Vanna White, but I didn't, you know. I know. I know. I understand. <laughs> well, thank you. That's amazing. Um, and, you know, we can save questions for the end if yeah, you want we'll to move say, on. Yeah, or what do you absolutely. Wanna, how do you want to do it? Okay. Yeah, let's so. let's we'll talk about it a little later. Um, okay. Right now, it's time to turn the tables on you. Oh gosh! Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I should have noticed. I didn't. I'm just going with the schedule, and I didn't notice what it actually was next. I'm like, oh darn. Okay. Yeah. I have to introduce myself according to Bill. I'm going with the schedule because I'm like, well, somebody made a schedule. We'll go with it. Okay. Exactly. Uh, so, um, okay. Um, uh, I am me. I am actually Lee Barkley Morton. I, uh, also wrote a, a very different kind of hybrid book, The Mortality Shot. Um, and, uh, and the bill actually, uh, there are a lot of smaller pieces in here. It's, it's made up of stories and uh, essays, um, and, uh, a sage text and, um, and actually, Bill and I seem to both be late night people on Facebook. So periodically, he, he would say, yeah, you have anything new? And I would send him an essay or a story. And he just very generously helped edit them. And so a number of these are that. And actually, one of them ended up in Heavy Feather Review, which which Bill also is the hybrid and poetry editor of. Um, and I started back in theater uh, doing these kind of experimental stage texts, one of which is in here. And they look kind of like this. They have lots of different... Uh, different voices, but they're not, they don't, doesn't look like a regular play. I'm not going to read from that though, because it would be too confusing. What I am going to read from is um, a piece that Bill knows well called Epistemology 99 Days, uh, which was in Heavy Feather Review. Uh, and I read if, actually. If, a, if, if I may interrupt you yes, for a second. You um, may. <laughs> um, I mean, I feel like. I feel like the pieces that are in the book um, are, they're also a hybrid text. And I feel like they arrive at, um, they arrive at, at a similar aesthetic to the weirdness I'm doing. Um, I, I actually agree. I just didn't want to presume. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I feel like you arrive at a similar aesthetic um, in the sense that um, you're you're not presuming a form. I mean, the the you know, in a lot of ways, it's a traditional memoir in there, but it sort of deconstructs itself as it as it goes along. And it's not trying to be, you know, a very clean workshopped to death series of pieces, which is what most writing you get is today. And it's, it, to me, it's just so odd because, I mean, think about what we went through textually to get here today. We have all these floating windows with texts and links. I don't under, and then, you know, you buy most books you know, and it's like, wow, it's like uh, modernism never happened. We're just kind of continuing right on from Dickens. It's it's like TV in print form. So if, so I, I'm wondering what what got you to this aesthetic of yours, because I obviously make no secret out of how much I think most of this writing is so old fashioned these days. Uh, that's a good question. Um, my stage texts came, that's where they, my writing started. And it started with cut-ups, actually. I started with the yieldy kind of Burroughsian slash Dada-esque cut-ups. Uh, 
And actually, I'm going to, when I read something new, it's going to partly be something old that is one of those. <laughs> it's going to be part of it. And then from there, I kind of use that idea of cutting up and going into oneself and then shifting um, points of view. And, and I just, I didn't do it with a huge um, agenda. You know, it was just like, that's how it came out. And I know that sounds really like mystifying or whatever, but it's actually what happened. And each of these pieces in here, I, you know, I forgot to mention how it came together is I saw this uh, uh, call out from a different publisher than published it, but uh, about like hybrid um, texts that came together as a book. And I realized I had written all these things in different ways, short stories, the essay, the thing I'm going to read, uh, which is a numbered essay uh, and uh, all that stuff. It all was about mortality. You know, I just realized that. And I didn't, it wasn't like, I'm going to write a bunch of things about mortality. It was just like, mortality came at me. Now it's partly because I'm 59 and mortality starts coming at you. And there's, and then it changed because this one is where it really shifts to not other people's mortality, but my own. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but um, so that, so, so, and, and I, and they gave me, the, I got one of those, you know, I don't know if you've ever, you've probably gotten these, I'll bet you have, I call them is back, oh, and Jesse sent me one of these ones, back jacket copy rejections, <laughs> which is like, it's like, well, if this was not the back jacket blurb, this would be great, <laughs> it's still a rejection, and I got one from the other publisher on this one, but the, this, then another publisher I saw and they just were like, we want something innovative. And I thought, oh, right, everybody says that. And then I looked at what they were actually publishing. And I was like, oh no, they really mean it. Which Jesse does too, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I hasten to add, um, but uh, you know, the, so that's that's how it came to be as a book. Um, but that, I don't know if that's really answers your question, what you're getting at, but hopefully somewhat. Well, better. I think you, I think you were ready to accept it as it was, and you didn't try to uh, pour it into any sort of pre-contained or pre-formatted mold. You just right. kind of let it, you let it be what it is. Exactly. And I do that with each thing that comes up. So, and, and I teach workshops and they are literally the anti- MFA workshops that I teach. I mean, it's exactly the opposite of what usually goes on there, where the whole idea is to bring out what people are actually trying to do. And I said, the one thing you're not allowed to say in this workshop is if I were writing this, I would, because who the fuck cares? You're not writing it. The other person is. <laughs> so, like, right. so, so that's kind of my whole shtick, you know, both as, you know, and and when people hear readings from my workshops, they're always shocked because they're like, everybody sounds so different. I'm like, right, <laughs> they should. You know, so Yeah, this is, yeah. I'm, yeah, I mean that, I I think, I, I think that too many, too much of literary culture or what we call literary culture is really just sort of a gussied up, dressed up version of, of fan culture. Like, Everybody has their fa favorite author and they just kind of their writing is like they're a they're a cover band for, you know, their favorite <laughs> author. And they don't really engage what the author is doing in any deeply intellectual way. It's just sort of, hey, protect, protect the brand, make your <laughs> brand stronger. I mean, that's that's all I see, you know. Mm. But anyway, let's let uh, let's hear from you. I want to hear you read your piece. Okay, I will do. Okay, so this is called Epistemology Ninety Nine Days. Uh, it it's what from uh, something I wrote at Ninety Nine Days of I got COVID in March twenty twenty. So this is as somebody here said to me. I don't know if he's here now. He said. In, in a little review on Amazon, which was actually a very long review on Amazon. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like a time capsule now, which is interesting. So anyway, one, my great grandmother died of the Spanish flu in 1918 in Ansonia, Connecticut. Two, I feel connected to her now in a visceral way in our apartment on West 204th Street in Manhattan. Indeed felt her presence before I got sick. I saw it coming in late January excuse me, felt it in my bones. No, more precisely, my lungs, a crushing heaviness in my chest, making it hard to breathe, a physical presentiment, begged New York City to shut down weeks before it did. Unsurprisingly, no one listened. Three, language is only approximate. The body is where this is happening. Its language stores the knowledge. Four, no, that's a lie. 
Five, I can only access bodily sensations via neurological channels, organizing it within milliseconds as my so-called experience. Six, Buddhists do this perhaps? This is why life on earth as we experience it is called maya, an illusion, a dream, a fiction. Seven, is the witness real, the vagus nerve? Eight, maybe this is all a hypothalamus after party. Nine, the energy surges like jolts of electricity shooting through my body from soul to crown out of the blue, usually when sitting or lying down. 10, the pins and needles in my legs, the newest symptom, neuropathy is what the neurologist diagnosed who struck the back of my ankles with his little hammer only to see neither of my feet move. Peripheral neuropathy, which on the chart reads plural neuropathy, obsessed with neurology. 11, am I damaged for good, damaged goods, anything good about damage? 12, will I heal fully or partially? 13, the chorus of I don't know from both doctors and my own research. 14, the endless stream of scary articles based on non-peer-reviewed research, reading them too late on my phone. 15, not good. 16, the fears of clots and heart attack and stroke, and before that, of hypoxia in my lungs. 17, I am lucky though, only minor neuropathy in my feet mostly, a sense of smell that comes and goes, steamroller fatigue. 18, this is considered lucky. 19, no one knows anything. 20, my body though, it does know, my cells won the battle. But is virus RNA masquerading as antibodies, Trojan cells waiting to attack? That is a theory in one of the frightening articles. 21, I am writing this at dawn. The sky had been hot pink at the building horizon. Now the whole sky is bright pale, waiting for the blue to color itself in. 22, I could not sleep and decided to get up to write this. 23, did I mention the burning of the esophagus, that which mimics a sensation of heart attack radiating out like mushroom cloud in the chest, making you sit upright to ask, is it gastritis, my lungs pleura and embers, my heart on fire? Checking the pulse oximeter for heart and oxygen readings, playing doctor at 3 a.m. 24, the sleepless nights, afraid that if I fall asleep, I might not wake up. What if I'm wrong? 25, the nights of having to access somehow that deep still place, vagus nerve, God, mind, witness, to ask it to ER or not to ER. 26, I do not go to the ER. Imagine the scene, imagine the looks of the doc seeing a middle-aged woman and thinking panic attack, oh, she has nerves. Imagine my lack of desire to face withering contempt or condescension alone since no one can join me. No male gaze in the form of my husband to mitigate this. Also can't see making the paramedics walk up and down a top floor walk up. My codependent fear is outweighing even the fear of dying, imagine. 27, walking into the door jam at 2 a.m. in the dark after reading one of the scary articles on my bright phone, adding a minor concussion to the mix. Surprise, oh, that was 28, surprise. 29, this is day, what, now, at time of writing, day 99. 30, some people count the weeks. 31, we are a cabal, the long tails, the long haulers. They don't know what to do with us. If doctors didn't get it too, I doubt anyone would believe us, but they do, male doctors. So now we are real, we are believed. Is it all lodged in my brain now? The impossibility of calm when need it most. 34, I forgot the number, sorry. Let it be just as it is. 35, the mantra. 36, the breathing. 37, the moment of calm in which I know I will be okay, like touching the bottom of the ocean floor beneath all the ruckus on the surface. 38, the inexplicable intuition that I will live to 98 and die of old age, happy as a clam. 39, seriously, that was the wording of the intuition, happy as a clam. Let us hope clams are indeed happy. <clears throat> 40, and looking out at the ocean. 41, perhaps Westray, the view from Kerbis, where the North Sea and Atlantic Ocean meet, more on the Atlantic side, at the beginning or end, depending where you start of the Western Walk. 42, Maize Sand, 
The seals that follow me as I walk along the shore, their heads popping up like U-boat periscopes, giving me the sight eye, this white sand and clear blue green sea where my soul resides stubbornly waiting for me to return. 43, as of now, not allowed to do so, I'm an American citizen of the pariah state, a death cult. 44, for real, it's like Jim Jones is president and we're being forced to buy his minions to drink the Kool-Aid. 45, a siren, a mournful siren, a reminder, you're the lucky one, you're alive, and the fear, will that be me next? 46, my best friend had to remind me when I was trying to muscle through work obligations around day 20 or so that were crushing me, you have what could be a fatal disease. 47, I thought she was laying it on a bit thick. 48, she was right. 49, friends who are not sick posting scary articles over and over. I hate them. The ones who are on the sidelines and have the luxury to mull it over like it's a science experiment or a fucking game of odds. I know that isn't fair, but it's how it feels. 50, the fear is impossible to describe. Such a tiny word for such a tsunami of sensation. 51, it's not all in my head any more than all your experiences or mine. 52, PTSD informs this, mine, yours, the nation's, the world's, we're being traumatized en masse. 53, the people who believe our death cult leader even more so, they are the Kool-Aid distributors. When they wake up, if they do, they will almost surely collapse. 54, the rest of us, what can be said? We cling to the idea that an election will change this. I do, is this naive? 55, nothing is normal, and now we're banned from Europe the United States of covid idiots who can't wear masks to save one another because freedom. 56, finally, our eternal adolescence is ending with consequences. Will we learn how many more people will have to die? Oh, 57, to have this is to have the body politic woven into one's own cells. 58, the political is personal to reverse the old feminist saw. 59, I knew it was anyway, but now my body is backing me up. 60. Sometimes I blame myself for my fear of it as if that brought it to me, a tortured reading of Artaud's notion of who did and did not succumb to the plague. He said those who were not afraid were spared. Well, we now know that formulation, as seductive as it appears, is flawed. 61. Did my husband and I get it from the guy who installed our new Wi-Fi the week before the shutdown? 62. Maybe. He didn't know either. We did not wear masks or gloves. I wiped everything down after he left. It was all about surfaces. At the time, we were told masks did not matter. Now we know they do. 63, Vietnam knew they have zero deaths. Life, as it turns out, is not cheap in Southeast Asia, as General Westmoreland claimed in 1974. No, it's cheap here in the land of the big PX, where there appears to be a fire sale on the vulnerable. 64, this is so much less clever than I had hoped. Instead, all you're getting is the raw footage. 65, I'm writing this naked, literally, sitting on my meditation chair in front of a gated window that opens out to a fire escape, the street five stories below, quiet at dawn. 66, my cat Ugo's butt and tail and hind legs are visible. He follows me around the apartment at night when I pace, then half hides behind the study divider, visible and not. 67, when I sleep, he curls up at my feet, and sometimes, the nights I've been most afraid, he sleeps next to my head. His purring so loud in my ear, emanating from his chest, the pulsing of his heart and lungs, a reminder of a calmer pulse. 68, I'm so tired now. 69, but if I try to sleep, I'll turn and turn and turn like a rotisserie chicken trying to get comfortable. 70, I will obsess over the prickly feeling that comes and goes in my legs and bottom of my feet. 71, sometimes I stare at my veins. Are they larger today, more pronounced? 72, it's scary to even say I'm getting better. 73, what if it hears me and comes back? 74, this shit makes you superstitious. 75, on some days I have actually said, get behind me, Satan. 76, and I am not religious. 77, this shit makes you religious. Belief in a false god, any god will do. 78, but I do believe in something, but hesitate to name it lest it diminish to human scale. 79, so the writing always feels false. If I believe naming diminishes, what the fuck am I doing? 80, Hugo's hind legs are up in the air now, his tail slayed forward. 
81. When I was a child, I wrote numbers from as, from one to as long as I kept writing. I didn't know when I, I don't know when I stopped, just numbers, one, two, three, four, you get the idea. 82. I forgot to tell the diagnostician about the dolphins. 83. Did I mention? My brain is now, in fact, being examined. 84, which is, of course, what every fourth grade teacher tells her unruly students needs to happen. 85, I thought when I was around 13 or 14 that I could learn to communicate with dolphins. I read John C. Lilly. I knew it was possible and therefore saved the world because they are so much smarter than us. 86, this was a common theme. 87, always trying to save the motherfucking world. 88, as if it ever wanted to be saved, or even if it does, why on earth would it be me that could do that? 89, no, that logic never stops me. 90, before the dolphins, age 11 to 12, I was an evangelical Baptist who was going to save the world by saving your soul. I knocked on doors witnessing. I handed out God is love pencils. 91, before that, I tried to figure out how to have a world without money. I lay awake at night, age five or six, trying to sort this out, staring up at the ceiling, my Winnie the Pooh bedspread on top of me, the Winnie the Pooh lampshade to my left and on the nightstand, all of my stuffed animals lined up on the right against the wall, just so. I tried, too, to imagine what the French looked like in chains, something my first grade teacher had told us, no doubt. This was 1969 in rural Maine. 692, after the dolphins, it was theater and politics. 93, and now it's my body and many other bodies, millions of us, the ravaged site of this body politic where battles raged. Can it be of service? 94, I'll go to the post-COVID recovery center of Mount Sinai on what will be day 101. 95, can they help me? Can I help them? 96, can this body save the world, our bodies, ourselves? 97, mine, yours? 98, the rising sun rinses the sky pale bright, and now I'll try to sleep again. Sometimes this works. 99, recounting days like sheep, March 23rd to June 30th, 2020. Okay, so that probably took longer than I meant to, but, <laughs> but thanks for listening, everybody. Um, yeah. So I, I feel like you do a better job of explaining everything that I was talking about just by reading. I feel like that, um, I mean, that's to me, that's 21st century realism. And I feel like it's truer, it's truer to the experience of a lot of people um, than some clever essay you know, that you might have read about your COVID diary, you know, and, and the COVID diary that you wrote, you know, while you were sequestered, you know, in, I don't know, Vermont or, you know, Tuscany or something. I, I, I feel like the fact that it's all mixed up, it feels like a news feed, you know, it it's, it's and 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 the thing is also is that um you know it's you but it's you wrapped around you know things that you found or your speaker it's your speaker wrapped around a lot of things found on the internet so it has that hybrid notion it's a combination of you know lived experience plus you know whatever we googled or whatever comes into our line of sight because of algorithms so that the writing is kind of a collaboration between yourself and this you know algorithm that knows a lot about you and that's the writing and i feel like that's the that's the uh 21st century realism that that i've been mentioning what what do you think no, that's a really good point. I mean, I like how you said that because I, I feel like that definitely, that piece of writing, definitely on my stage text and all the best things I've written, I think are very much in the present. And the present for me includes all the things going on. And um, there's a, was a, a, it is a really interesting uh, theater artist. He's still alive, but he doesn't make stuff anymore called Richard Foreman. Um, 
And, and he also had a whole theory when he was writing of letting interruptions occur. Like, and, and then when he directed his stuff onto the stage, he did the same thing. Um, and so for me, you know, and what I like about what you did as well is it is that like, here we are, let's, let's start with here. We actually are. And, and look at that. And also you did something that Foreman, say, I remember his favorite thing. He's like, it's easy to make beauty out of the beautiful. How can you make beauty, you know, in the gaps of what's not beautiful. And, um, it, and, and that's also a very interesting idea. Um, and, and yet, you know, I feel like also yours and mine, and one of the things you had wanted to talk about is being, you know, is, is writers working outside of academia, and is I think we're just a little closer to the ground even than Foreman was when he was making his work. Um, his, you yeah. know, he had, and he was very open about it. this. Was the one thing that made it okay is he was open about having a trust fund. Most people have them, and don't say anything. He actually had one and was open about it. So I gave him a lot of credit for that. But, uh, but still, uh, yeah, know. I mean, like it's uh, for a lot of people, it's all kind of cosplay, you know. And yeah, no, I I do know <laughs> very well. Yes, I mean, you know, because like living in New York, especially. You know, you see all these people and they go all to all the readings and they are very fashionably unfashionable, but in a fashionable way. And <laughs> and and um, uh, I think my friend Susan, who's on the call tonight, she said, you know, their lives are sustained by these underground aquifers of money. You know, that just the money just sort of oozes up through the through the earth and you know they have like these lives and you know um but the actual fact that i mean that's why i feel like a lot of people like you know they go and they get phds and who's paying for these phds i don't know they're related to the white people that own the color blue that's who's paying for all these phds <laughs> and i feel like that's one of the reasons why I mean, they never have had a job, so they don't really know what's what's happening. That's my view. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of my working class view of things, <laughs> you know, um, and they don't know how precarious people's lives are. And I feel like more of the writing is needs to lean into those moments. I mean, we're all just like one or two trips away to the hospital away from like financial ruin man it's really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's really awful you know i'm mean, like mm -hmm. my myself um you know i i through the while you were really sick with covid you know i was not making any money and you know i started looking for work and you know, everybody says, oh, yeah, we're looking for diversity. Diversity doesn't include like older people, you know. Oh, and, ageism is the last standing. We're not going to deal with it thing. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, you got it. Absolutely. You, you yeah. got it. You got it, sister. You uh, know, yeah, I do. <laughs> and you know that, <laughs> you know, and you get the. Um, you know. You want to get hired. Nobody wants you. And it's sort of like a presentiment of what's going to happen, you know, mm -hmm. to all of us eventually. Like, you know, we're we're just capitalism won't won't need us anymore, and that'll be it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, I'd like to read. I like to read something new. Good. And then, yes. And then Perfect I want timing. Yeah, and this is a little different from. Um. It's a little different from the uh, chat book, and um, it's part of an ongoing series, the latest installment of which was up on uh, Fences website recently. But this 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 opening bit was um, was in the Laurel Review. The latest it's in the latest issue of the Laurel Review. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to read a little bit. It won't be long. Then I'll turn it back over to you, and then we'll have some questions. I guess. <laughs> um yeah hopefully all right so this is from just an ongoing essay hybrid thing the me 
that wants to kill me always comes floating up. It presses my chest from the center, fists wide, grip able to pull memory from deepest ocean. The years have given it heft. I used to think age would make me stronger. Books too. The words I memorized become a sentence coughed into a carved parenthesis. Every morning, the crocodile silence. The me waits just below the skin, bare, illumined, fingers wrinkled at the tips. I have lived long enough to hate myself for the right reason. A few years ago, my friend celebrated his 50th birthday a week early by borrowing the nose of a speeding train to spray his guts in the air like champagne. I think of him every morning. I think of him now as I collect pieces of his body from this wave. The San Benito was an armful of size worn during the Spanish Inquisition. When dotted with dragons, devils, flames, it held a heretic to be burned alive. When fringed with the fuego revolto or downward pointing flame, it dressed a gentler fate. The heretic, regretful of their deeds, was strangled before the fire was lit. I think of the San Benito and the people in my life. My friend who killed himself, he wore the San Benito without knowing he wore it and never being told to put it on. My mother, father, they also wore it and passed it to me. An invisible garment, a whisper above the skin, the San Benito I wore was stained with years, thoughts, memories. These were my dragons, my devils, my flames. My father's San Benito was a waiter's uniform, black polyester pants, white shirt, black vest with satin back. He always wore it. He could never take it off. Even when he tore it from his body, buttons flying across the kitchen. Sometimes there'd be blood where his bow tie was supposed to be. Sometimes a trail of lipstick at the collar. How he looked never mattered. It was the smell, the smell of thousands of meals, of spilled drinks, of vomit streaked with broken glass on the underside of the bar. The smell rested at the back of the throat and couldn't be drowned. He kept a pad tucked behind the Winston 100s in his shirt pocket. The pad had thin pages, each separated by a strip of carbon. Orders were scrawled along the top page. The carbon copied the orders to a page beneath his shirt. This page was covered with all the orders he had ever been get, given. It filled the space inside him, filled the space where other people write their dreams. My friend also had a page inside him. The page wasn't the bar bathroom wall my father's was. The page was blank. At times, dreams were written on it, but they'd be erased, painted over. My friend wouldn't allow dreams to stay. Every eight months, every, every new job, he wrote new ones always in bigger letters, slanting upward. Two weeks before he died, he read from the page. This time, everything he wanted to rub away. I, wanted, I reminded him of the good on that page, his wife, young daughter, the house he bought with his successes. He didn't hear me. First in his family to go to college, he talked through, talked over, behind and above me. He talked as a person who wanted to relive each shame, line by line. Tonight, 
a shame that ripens in forgotten trees. I think of his daughter. She's old enough to wonder now and mistake the shame she feels as her own. What did everyone tell her? People pretend to protect others. They protect themselves. No one wants to admit they are dying from the same disease. My mother peeled shame from the bottoms of her feet. It came off in long strips that narrowed at the toes. I thought my father fisted it into her. When she died, I realized she always had it. It looked out from her, laughed. It was the self below the self, waiting, watching. Her shame told her to have a life that left bruises around the eyes. That's really beautiful, Bill. And I um, I can't just go to my thing right away. I just need to say something about it. I, you know, you were talking about the realist, the 21st century realism, which that is definitely, but you know, what it made me think of is the 19th century realist, which would be Whitman and the 20th century realist, which would be Ginsburg. Um, you know, and, and it just reminded me of both of those, what you just read, uh, and, you know, your version and not a cover band, <laughs> but, but it just, yeah, I'm not hard. a, I'm not a Sylvia Plath cover band. No, no, you're not. I, di I didn't even mention her, um, <laughs> but I was thinking more because of the cadences and that outward view that comes inward like Whitman does. Whitman's the first poet that made me cry when I was 16. I read Whitman. It's the first time anything had gotten anywhere near me that was poetry. Um, and, uh, and Ginsburg is, you know, when you think of the things he was writing about, the stuff right in his purview, um, I think it was very, uh, so to me, that's a compliment. It, it's not that it's the same. It's just that I was no, thinking I about what that means about realism in in terms of when where you're pla where you're planted. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's really interesting. So, um, yeah. I mean, I I I think that um, if if you, I think people root for you as an artist if they feel that you're taking a risk. I think, you know, too many writers think that being a good writer is being a clever writer. Hmm. And I think we need to get over our own cleverness. Oh, I couldn't agree more with that. <laughs> you know, I call it Fabergé egg writing. I think what yeah. you're talking about is what I call, that's what I call that. It's like, oh, that's really beautiful and completely untouchable. And it is just sitting there and I can look at it and be like, wow, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. No, exactly. I feel like it's, it's, oh, thanks, Susan. I mean, I feel like people, if they, if they hear like this messy stuff, whether it's yeah. my, the messy stuff I just read or the messy stuff that you read, um, they realize that that's a real person or what appears to be a real person doing something and they're on your side, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's true. Um, yeah, and I think that's true for people. I think when when uh, people who are used to seeing a certain thing read certain, like I've had a lot of responses from people, including age potential agents and stuff on things like this is great, this is amazing. I have no idea how to sell it. Like that's a, like you know a lot of back jacket copy rejections with, and I don't know how to sell it. So um, it's it's quite a thing uh, when you're when you're when you're actually doing something that's not already done. Um, and I, and I'm going to I'm actually going to read something because you you asked me to so I'm going to do that quickly now it's it's pretty short. Um, I am working on a memoir as you might have gathered from what I read before about my head being examined. I was uh, recently diagnosed autistic at the age of 57. <laughs> And um, and it's and been, been um, I don't know if you can mute yourself, Bill, because I think I'm getting a little bit of feedback from you. Do you mind? Here, there. Okay. I don't know if you, okay. So, um, yeah. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm working on a memoir. Don't think it's muted. For some reason, I can't mute you. I don't know why. Um, and, uh, and it, 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 it's about looking at all the various aspects of my past and the way I was looking at them before. And 
and some of it deals with goes all the way back to when I cut up words. So I'm just going to read it because I think it's honestly my writing is better than my talking about my writing. Um, and it's called uh, Traumatism. Talk to me, don't talk to me. She knows she needs to tell you this story, but she does not want to tell you this story. There are some stories that are harder to tell than others, some that cost. Will you listen? Will you hold a container for her that is strong enough? She knows she can come back. Maybe a rope she can hang on to, some body armor. She wanted to tell you the story about autism and trauma and yoga and art without describing certain things because it feels like trauma porn, like some kind of payment she has to make. I'm speaking about her in the third person to protect her in case that's not entirely obvious. Here she is 25 years ago, cutting up texts, knocking at the prison walls, listening out for a weak spot where it might give. <clears throat> I speak in language where I'm nothing, closely linked to the point of broken umbrellas. I'm in the death of autonomous lockup. I'm in the death of action, their theories positing how long I had been there infinitely, no movement, no thought to just fall down. The marriage of true tension has disappeared. Our heroine now sees that my hoping for it has given a framework. There are multitudes, each one myself. You can see her almost trapped inside the cocoon, signaling, wanting out, not wanting, not knowing how, so aware of the camouflage, the trap, the prison. She knows you can hear it. She knows she has to fall. She knows the freeze. She knows what it is to be trapped. She knows when she has to play dead. She knows she cannot attack this trap directly. How does she know this? Well, it's in part because of a story she's tried to tell in so many ways and each time failed. The words direct seem too frightening to share, also inadequate. You were able to trick her into writing, into believing I existed, even if in a language where I'm nothing closely linked to the point of view of umbrellas, broken umbrellas, where there are multitudes, each one myself. She thinks it's mostly about gender. She's not wrong, but it's also about trauma lodged in the body and undiagnosed autism and never being seen or heard and knowing it, but not knowing how to be seen or heard, except through masks. And yes, Artaud said that masks allow truth to come out, and he may be right, but what about when the mask is purely defensive? I did trick her into believing I existed with writing. First cutting up pre-existing text, then more free form. But until recently, I didn't even know who the I was. This weekend, seeing words said of mine on a stage and speaking afterwards back to the sanctuary, feeling heard, feeling exposed, feeling all of it. The next day, the burnout. Inevitable, I suppose. But it's the reason I have not built the career I had hoped in theater or writing or anything else. <clears throat> really, because no matter what I do, after I put myself out there, I then have to hide. And what am I? What, and what I'm supposed to do is keep going and keep putting myself out there and follow up and make shit happen, but I can't. And part of the burnout can involve shame because of this, knowing what I should be doing and seeing people talking about all the need to do all the need to do X and Y and barely getting to B or C, a sense of being chronically behind. <clears throat> Excuse me that can then lead to gerbil wheel workaholism that produces nothing valuable except an even worse burnout. Only connect, E.M. Forrester counseled. Yes, but how? How can you connect when the only you that is you is something someone most people have trouble even understanding? The fact is, even at the lovely event where my words are being read by fabulous actors and the audience is responsive and kind, I know I'm masking. It's necessary masking. Probably even neurotypical people mask this way to some extent. It's the mask of the professional. And when in talk back afterwards, I feel the pressure to put on an increasingly uncomfortable mask of someone who knows something about something, like my own writing. And while I'm doing a fairly convincing job of saying things that appear to make sense to people, the whole time I'm wondering, is that really true? Do I feel that way? Is that why I wrote that? And I try to add this in too, but then I also hear myself saying after Adam says, but you seem to make some declarations in the book. Yes, it's true, because I have been told by more than one therapist over the years after I've said, I don't know, maybe you do know, and that's true too. And what I mean to be writing about is this, autistic burnout. And it comes from all of this, the masking, the questioning, the not knowing and the knowing, <clears throat> but maybe not wanting to know what I know in equal measure. Because what I do know is this, there is no one way to be or one thing I'm saying or whatever 
And there is a pressure in this capitalist world to brand oneself and to do one thing and be known for it. And I've never done that and I have no interest in it and I pay a heavy price as a consequence. And whenever I have tried to mold myself to these market forces, I fail spectacularly under the weight of my own self-doubt and even self-hatred because I know it is false. This is another autistic trait, as it turns out, the need to act ethically consistently in all things and a visceral feeling of wrongness when not able to do so. Well, I'm sure many will say, oh, I feel this way too. The thing I've discovered by talking to other autistic adults is we feel it to such a degree it can make us sick. So all the happy clappy concepts that weasel around this in the so-called normal world about compromise and nuance don't work for us because our entire beings revolt. So there's a tiny little, not yet completely refined <laughs> excerpt from the memoir. So yeah. I unmute myself. You did, yes. I did indeed. Uh, so I am looking at some of the chat window. Yeah. Oh, um, somebody asked me, um, uh, Susan asked the first bit there. Um, that was in yeah. the Laurel. That was in the Laurel review. Uh, I thought I had a copy. Yeah, the current issue of the Laurel, like resting on your Laurels review. Um, do we have any other questions? Anything yeah. about anything for Bill for me about text or anything? Oh wait, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna change. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> make it so you can okay you should so oh, people can talk oh, oh you should be able to unmute yourself now i've had it that way before okay you should be able to unmute yourself um if you don't feel comfortable speaking out loud you can always put a question in the chat so go for it if anyone has any questions no okay well we can ask each other questions until someone else might have one <laughs> Well, I'll ask you, um, how far into this memoirish piece are you? I honestly don't know the answer to that question, hilariously, given what I just said. Uh, the reason I say that is I have many words written, um, but finding the voice for it and how I want to do it um, is turning out to be very tricky for a lot of reasons. And one of them is is um, beginning to really understand the idea of masking and masked text and mass words. And, and I kind of realized that my stage texts are probably unmasked autistic texts more than my prose, um, but maybe I'm wrong. You know, so I'm just, I'm trying to kind of work all that out. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about directly because all the words are um, inherited, right? And and as I've talked to other autistic people, and, and this is probably true of everyone to some degree, to be honest, but like just, it's a very specific sense of like, there's so much in the things that are most important, feel like they don't have words. Um, so how do well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I feel, well, the thing is, is that anybody who's had a certain kind of life experience, the first, you know, it's like the first rule of, uh, you know, Fight Club is, you know, you don't, <laughs> right. you don't talk about it. And you kind of put, you put other words in front of these other words. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you just kind of go about your life. And you kind of run on two tracks and the real feelings don't get expressed because they're shame and mm -hmm. nobody cares. You know, I think that's, that's what you learn, you know, and um, you know, however you want to talk about it, but I feel like most of it is, you know, you don't count. That's 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 what it is. You know, you don't count. Well, Nobody cares. yeah, you know, it, you don't count. Yeah. And it's interesting, though, because um, that's definitely true. And, and, and kind of getting to that is true. And I but I feel also like there's this interesting thing that's happening right now in sort of an awareness of autistic life, let's say, 
and I feel like there's kind of almost like a, a, a pre Stonewall moment we're in. <laughs> uh, and, you know, where maybe there's an understanding of the full humanity. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I if you were to do like, you know, like word clouds about autism in, in usage, you know, the exploding, you know, you have a graph, you know, the graph mm -hmm. it's like autistic. And, you know, like last year, you know, every time like some, some tech CEO does something, they talk about their autism, like that's the reason as if having this kind of this condition makes you a sociopath, you know? It's like, bring back sociopath, bring <laughs> that back. It's funny you, you know? say that, because when I was being diagnosed, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. Oh, when I was being diagnosed, I actually said that to the woman. I was like, am I just a sociopath? <laughs> and she's like, no, I think you're autistic. I'm like, okay, that's a relief, because I actually was wondering the same thing. It's kind of funny. So I feel like there's, <laughs> I mean, you know, people, um, I don't know. I mean, I think every time something becomes popular, it's just another way to stigmatize people because I don't think, I don't mm -hmm. think if you, if, you know, I, I don't think people understand or care to understand. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be so dark. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I understand. It's just that I, I'm not going to give up because there's a lot of reasons. I feel like even though my life is what it is and I'm freelance and precarious and this and that, I feel like I have enough privilege in that I can talk about this without losing a job or whatever. And I, yeah, of um, and, and I feel that Actually, for me, it was a liberation. This is the main thing that, you know, this this little excerpt doesn't show, but to me, it was the biggest, most liberating moment in my life. And actually, that's what I want to talk about is that to understand that one's wiring is different and then you stop trying to become somebody else that you're not and never going to be. It was like this huge weight came off of me. So it kind of had the reverse feeling. So just so you know, yeah. I'm um, wondering before we end our show today, does anybody mm. else have anything to say? Yeah. And then we're just going to raffle off the uh, easy bake oven that we were yes. talking about before. <laughs> so what is this Mindy? Mindy wrote, you may want to look at the new YA novel Torch about teens, Eastern Europe and 1968 is on the spectrum. Okay, great. And one of the main current. Yeah, great. That's wonderful. Yeah, there's a lot more writing and stuff out there. Um, and I'm really excited about it, especially younger people are really into it. Like they get it. And it's uh, it's really interesting um, to see that. So I think YA is kind of a genius move on your friend's part, to be honest. I, um, yeah. Talk about getting paid, man. Yeah, you write a good YA book. Forget it, man. You're <laughs> uh, you're going right to the bank. <laughs> I think that's okay, though. I kind of think it's cool that there's all that's nothing wrong there. with people. Get, there's no wrong with people getting paid. <laughs> mm -mm. Not wrong with people getting paid. Nope. <laughs> um, so this has been a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Thank thank you so much. It was nice. Yeah. It's nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was July 2021 when we did the reading outside of KGB outside. Yes, I'm yes still indeed. Not, I'm still not an inside goer. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's in, that's a whole other thing we didn't talk about. I'm going to be talking about with Sonia Huber more in February if anyone's interested about disability rights and the way this has all been just throw the vulnerable people under the bus time and uh, it's quite interesting to see <laughs> that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's yeah. like, you know, don't get in the way of anybody making a buck. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, uh, I, I guess we're technically at 7.15. So I just wanted to say quickly for those of you, this, the soul survivors, um, you probably know this, but the next, there's there's a link there to all the rest of these wonderful talks. And the next person is Sharon Mesmer, who I also know you know, Bill, and she's going to be my next victim <laughs> next week and i'm really and looking forward your virtual to that. your virtual killing spree yes yeah My virtual killing spree and i hope you don't mind <laughs> having been part of it it's been great to, i mean it's been great to see you bill and and i really you know want to thank you so much for all the help you know you've given me over the years for no good reason at all and i <laughs> i 
<laughs> which is the best reason of all, you know? Yes. Well, this is the thing is like, you actually know how to have a non-transactional relationship and that I, I cherish that. I cherish that with you and, and basically I mean, everybody, I'll, I think I'll, on I'll, this call, come to think of it, I look at all four of you. I think, yep, all four of you. Yep. <laughs> but, I mean, I'll, I'll end, I'll end with a little anecdote and then I'll let everybody go back to their regularly scheduled days, uh, yes. reg regularly scheduled day. I mean, you know, you hear all of the language about inclusivity and social poetics and all of that. And it's, it's just not true. And I'll give you an example. I mean, a few years ago, I was at a, I was doing a reading in Brooklyn and uh, I was hosting a reading in Brooklyn and, um, you know, we we're having like the little networking bit and some folks were talking to my wife and they were all glad to talk to her because, you know, you're a little older. So you assume, oh, she must be influential. As soon as they found out that they couldn't help her, it was just like, forget it. <laughs> we don't want to talk to you. You know, it's, you know, this it's, it's, I feel like the careerism and all of this is just off the chain, you know? And people yeah. just write so that they can get published in the right place so mm -hmm. that they can turn that yeah. into a job. And yo, that's fine. You know, that's the path you want to take. But let's not confuse that with important art. You know, it's just yeah. not art. It's, it's you know, the 30th, you know, billionth uh, version of a John Ashbery poem or a Sylvia Plath thing. And it's... Yo, it's nothing new about this shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, I agree. And the irony is that we finally met in person at one of the epicenters of that precise thing. And and I think that because we were at AWP. Oh, you were there too, Mindy, in 2019, which I now that I know I'm autistic. I'm like, my God, that I mean, it was a sensory nightmare for me, just for starters. But it, ironically, well, I mean, look, you know, you, you know, go, you meet, you there. go and you meet people and you do your thing and then you have to go and like lie down in a hyperbaric chamber for uh, 18 hours. I mean, I get that. <laughs> exactly. Hell is other people. You don't have to be <laughs> autistic to feel that way. <laughs> I, I'm I'm not I'm not holding the the patent on that. Don't worry. <laughs> but I'm just anyway. saying that's the irony. As I met you there, this is a, my whole point of that is no matter how hellacious a place is, you can. And then Mindy and I got close there too. So it was like it's kind of interesting. And we all live in New York, but we had to all be in Portland, Oregon, so we could whatever. But like that, you know. Even in those environments is my point. I'm trying to end on a happy note. Um, like, yes, this is this this is the water skiing squirrel part of the conversation. Right, exactly. Yeah. This is where I somebody once accused me of being Norman Peel esque in my attempt to positive shit in anything. I think I think he might be right. It's sort of a sad thing, but it's true. But I, I, yeah, but honestly, I do think that's what's cool. And I'm glad I met you and i um, glad people stuck around for a bit. And um, yeah, I guess we'll technically stop recording now. I'm going to do that.